When the first nuclear bomb was tested on July 16, 1945, it marked a watershed in the destructive potential available to humanity. Until that point, weapons of almost every kind typically had to be used in large numbers by large groups of soldiers to be militarily effective. With the advent of atomic weaponry, arsenals could reduce one of a hostile country's greatest cities to a scorched heap of rubble and sickly survivors in a matter of seconds, using only a single device and a handful of men. When the Soviet Union tested its first atomic bomb in 1949, and its first intercontinental bomber in 1956, the atomic bomb ceased to be an anomaly solely in the hands of the United States and became a staple of modern military strategy, one that could be expected to be widely used if war ever broke out between countries that possessed it. The pace of the arms race graduated from atomic bombs to much more powerful hydrogen bombs and eventually to missiles. All kinds of other nuclear weapons were being developed at both the tactical and the strategic level, including artillery, landmines, and man-portable rocket launchers. At the start of the 1960s, the linchpin of both countries' arsenals, however, consisted of unguided, airdropped nuclear bombs meant for the large cities of the opposing superpower. In 1961, the Soviet Union was behind the United States in its development of these technologies, as well as the quality, quantity, and readiness of these weapons. To frighten the United States and to show its resolve and ability to continue the arms race, the Soviet Union began working on a hydrogen bomb that would dwarf any that came before it. The most powerful device hitherto exploded by the Soviet military had an explosive yield of three megatons of TNT equivalent. This new device would have an explosive yield of 50 megatons, 16 times greater than any other weapon tested by the USSR, and thousands of times more powerful than the atomic bombs used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The new Wonder Weapon's official designation was the underwhelming and mysterious sounding Project 602, and from the time that it was first conceptualized to its first and only test, the entire venture lasted only 112 days. When the test occurred over the Soviet Arctic island chain, of Novaya Zemla on October 30th, 1961. It was carried out by a massive Tu-95 heavy bomber. Yet the device, nearly three meters in diameter, eight meters in length, and with a weight of 27 tons, was so massive that the fuselage fuel tanks and the doors on the bomb bay had to be removed from the underside of the plane. Even still, most of the bombs still couldn't fit inside the aircraft, so most of it was left exposed underneath the fuselage for the flight to the test zone. The test was an almost suicidal endeavor for the personnel participating, even with the safety measures that were put in place. These included an 800 kilogram parachute affixed to the bomb that would give the bomber that was carrying it and the accompanying observation plane, time to reach a safe distance 45 kilometers from the test site. They would have 188 seconds, or just over three minutes, to make it to that distance. To further protect the crew, the aircraft involved in the test were painted with white anti-flash paint to minimize the effect of the thermal radiation released by the explosion which could be dangerous even tens of kilometers away. Even the propellers of the aircraft were painted in such a manner, leaving nothing to chance. After slowly descending via parachute for three minutes after the drop, 
The bomb detonated four kilometers above the ground and immediately consumed everything around it in our gargantuan, searing flash. Even from the massive, well-protected cameras 20 kilometers away, the spectacle was incredible and terrifying. On one of the observing aircraft, one airman recalled, quote, The clouds beneath the aircraft and in the distance were lit up by the powerful flash. The sea of light spread under the hatch, and even clouds began to glow and become transparent. At that moment, our aircraft emerged from between two cloud layers, and down below in the gap, a huge, bright orange ball was emerging. The ball was powerful and arrogant like Jupiter. Slowly and silently it crept upwards. Having broken through the thick layer of clouds, it kept growing. It seemed to suck the whole earth into it. The spectacle was fantastic, unreal, and supernatural. End quote. The bomb's destructive power was expected to be so great that no structures or equipment were even set in place to illustrate the effects of the bomb. As was often the case in nuclear tests at the time. Nevertheless, plenty of structures accidentally served that purpose. One abandoned settlement 55 kilometers from ground zero was completely destroyed. Below the fireball, the blast pressure was 300 pounds per square inch six times higher than at the center of the blast in Hiroshima, and the shockwave prevented the fireball from ever touching the ground. Window panes were broken up to 900 kilometers away, and in the intermediate range, wooden houses collapsed, and stone houses lost their roofs. The shockwave from the blast went around the world a total of three times. The fireball from the explosion was visible for up to a thousand kilometers, and the mushroom cloud created by the detonation rose to a height of 64 kilometers, or 210,000 feet, in the atmosphere. If no obstructions existed, people up to 100 kilometers away could have experienced third-degree burns as a result of the test. People felt the shockwave or heard the explosion over 800 kilometers away. In fact, a lone US observation aircraft that had infiltrated the unprotected testing zone had some of its fuselage burned by the heat of the blast, even through its protective coat of anti-flash paint. One can probably imagine the results if such a weapon were dropped on any NATO power's larger cities including New York, Chicago, London, Paris, or Berlin, or if the weapon had been configured with an explosive yield of 100 megatons as originally planned. Very little, if anything, would have been left of a city made even from modern structures had the weapon been employed. The explosion disrupted radio communications all along the flight path of the test aircraft, so their fate remained unknown, almost until they landed, back on the Soviet mainland. All of the participating airmen survived, and Major Andrei Dernovsev, who commanded the mission and flew the bomb into place, 
was decorated as a hero of the Soviet Union and promoted to Lieutenant Colonel. Soon after visiting Ground Zero, in the aftermath of the explosion, one of the Soviet surveyors recorded that, quote, the ground surface of the island has been leveled, swept, and licked, so that it looks like a skating rink. There is not a trace of unevenness on the ground. Everything in this area has been swept clean, scoured, melted, and blown away, end quote. The impact of Tsar Bomba was partially felt in the Partial Test Ban Treaty of 1963, which banned its signatories from conducting further nuclear tests in the Earth's atmosphere or in space, at a time when the tests were becoming more frequent and more powerful. And in some ways, the most chilling aspect of all of this wasn't the Tsar Bomba itself. Rather, it is the fact that such a tool of such earth-shattering power was technologically obsolete by the time it was tested. Nuclear bombs, such as Tsar Bomba, had to be carried by large, vulnerable bombers flying long, perilous flights to targets that were in some cases entire continents away. But by the end of the 1960s, Airdropped nuclear bombs of all kinds were being sidelined in favor of warheads carried on missiles launched from underground silos and submarines. Missiles that could be launched thousands of miles and for which no intercepting technology was available. In 1964, strategic missiles overtook bombers as the main delivery method for nuclear weapons in both superpowers arsenals. Today, a single nuclear missile can independently fire individual warheads at separate targets. Although Tsar Bomba was and remains the single most powerful weapon ever developed, humanity has still managed to collectively outdo itself. A situation that has not fundamentally changed even since the end of the Cold War. As a result, the terrifying legacy of this weapon is that there is seemingly no end in sight to humanity's capacity for destruction, and that the book is never closed on such a capability.